and I told you I'd give you a report on how I'm doing and first I want to give some advice to anybody who's going through what I went through. I'm going to tell you there's no easy way to get through it. You have to work through this. It's going to take a true effort. The day I woke up, I had a nurse come in there. I called her Nurse Cratchit. She was a mean old gal, let me tell you. <laughs> that She came up and she started telling me that today you're going to get up. Today you're going to walk. Today you're going to... And I thought, oh my goodness. I had hoses and tubes and things hanging out everywhere. Well, anyway, for those of you that may be having chest pain, I want to tell you this is nothing to mess with. I wasn't having classic heart attacks, as people would say. I was getting... Right here, it's this little, it was a pinch and it hurt and it was down in. I was just a tiny bit short of breath, not very short. I want to say that the worst part about it was I didn't know what was happening to me. I'd had it for a long time. I'd gone to the doctor several times, the cardiologist. I went to the ER once. They've all done echocardiograms. They did stress tests. They did chemical stress tests. They... Uh, they told me I had good blood flow through my heart. Everything was wonderful and great. Then all of a sudden, like I say, I had this pinch. And every time I'd get it, I'd go in there. Let me tell you, an aspirin can be your best friend. An aspirin can mask what's really going on under the surface. And I had no idea, but I did know that an aspirin can save your life. So what I was doing was I was popping an aspirin. I'd chew it up like candy and... I hate to say it, you know, it's a nasty flavor, but you get used to it after a while, I did. Anyway, I want to tell you that in all of this, I went to bed one night. I was right in the middle of a very stressful time in my life. I'd had a dear friend named John pass away. I'd had a wedding and another one coming up. My dad had been sick, and I'd been running back and forth 50 miles away to his town to take him to chemo a couple times a week at least and to check on him about a couple more times than that a week. So like three or four, or maybe five visits a week. All I want to say is that if this is you and you're overloaded and you're really stressing out, you got to start lightening the load. You really do. Since then, I've lightened the load quite a bit. I've learned to delegate a lot and I've learned to take it easy a lot. I want to say that when my dad passed away, it was pretty stressful. I had to work on organizing his funeral service. I want to say that in all of that went on, it wasn't until doing his estate and the, the impact, the reality of him not being there anymore. One of my best friends in the whole wide world, and I couldn't even talk to him anymore. This can be you, too. This can happen. I want to tell you that that pinch started in and it started working on me and you know up until that time I found myself getting tireder and tireder more wore out and more wore out I want to say that every time I turned around I'd I'd go to pull the truck in the backyard and load it with something and I'd think oh my gosh just getting through the gate and getting the truck in I'm getting too tired I gotta go take a break for a minute and I'd go in the house and relax I want to say my wife I'd go out and brush our big St. Bernard dog and I'd get him about a third of the way done. I'd go in and have to take a nap. I mean, I was wore out. And I want to tell you that can be happening to you too. If it's happening to you, I want to tell you, don't play games with it. There was a third test that those doctors never did on me. The third test was the one they did the night that I said, let's go see the doctor. I think I'm in trouble. What they did was they ran a scope up into my heart. I guess it's called an angiogram. And they went in there and they looked and, uh-oh, Doc says, you're going to Phoenix. I lived, I was in Sholo at the time at the hospital. He says, you are probably a candidate for a quadruple bypass. They loaded me in a helicopter, flew me to Phoenix, to, and I insisted I wanted to go to Arizona Heart because I have a lot... I had, from past experience, I was a Phoenix firefighter for a time, and from past experience, I know them to be the specialist. When you got heart trouble, you go to the heart place. When you have a brain injury or something of that sort, you want to go to where they deal with that, and that would be Barrels Neurological right in the same kind of area. 
all out of St. Joseph's. Well, anyway, now it's called Abrazo Heart, Heart Hospital, which is still Arizona Heart. I want to tell you that Arizona Heart is a fine institution, great surgeons. I had Dr. Hessel. He was a really fine surgeon. He has since retired, so I'm sorry to tell you that. I want to say that six months out, my wound has healed perfectly. I can give you a little peek real quick, see? It's, it has healed really well. Right in my clavicle, sometimes it hurts sometimes, right in here on my, on my right side. They must have had to cut through it and broke through it. And uh, <clears throat> let me tell you, when they open you up, they cut nerves. And there's a, mamma, a mam, mammillary nerve, I guess they call it. Whew, man, that baby hurts. And all of what's happening for about the next year or year and a half, they tell me, those nerves are trying to reconnect. And sometimes I can sit there and I think, boy, that hurts. Man, is that down in? Is that my heart? What is that? And I'll go, oh. And I'll poke in a certain spot, and it's a nerve. And boy, you can tell because it's hot. And you touch it, and you go, oh, oh, don't do that. Don't touch that. Don't mess with it. And at night, I can lay there, and I can tickle right in the area right here on the right side. And it's still numb. And so you can't feel it on the surface. And sometimes I can poke in a certain place, and I can feel not a pain, but like a little nerve. And then there's a pain at the end, but then you touch there and there's no pain. You touch here and oop, there it went again. So you got to kind of know that you're going to have a lot of quirks after this is all done. I want to tell you something. My little pillow, my heart pillow, was my best friend. I ended up with walking pneumonia in December. I was coughing and coughing and coughing and coughing. I was, it turns out I was allergic to metropolol. That was the med, the first med they sent me out on. We had no idea what was going on. Everybody kept telling me, you've got bronchitis. Finally, I got a hold of Dr. Hessel, and I said, I don't know what's going on. The PC's telling me that it looks like bronchitis. Nobody can tell me exactly what my malady really is. All I know is that there's something really wrong here, and it has to be fixed. I'm going to tell you something. I was one sick puppy. In fact, I thought I was swirling for maybe one of the last times before you go down the toilet. And uh, told the wife, said, you gotta take me back to that doctor, the hospital again. We went to the hospital. They did their little gamut of tests and stuff. Said, oh, we did a full cardio workup on you and you're all good. I said, man, I'm not leaving. There's so and you gotta, you have got to put your foot down sometimes. And you got to say, no, you are not throwing me out of this place. We're not leaving until we get this right. There's something wrong here, and you've got to fix it. Well, let me just tell you that they said, well, there's one last test. Let's check you for blood clots in your lungs. So they took me in, put me in the CT scan tube, and they injected me with, with an IV of, I'm assuming it was a uh, iodine injection of some sort. And they say, oh, it's going to get hot. You're going to feel like you're going to pee your pants. And it did. And so I go through the tunnel, and the, not the tunnel, the, two, the little circle donut. And you go, go through, you come out, do it a couple few times. A little bit later, doctor walks in and says, oh, surprise. You have this tiny little bit of pneumonia down in the bottom of your lungs. We couldn't hear it with a stethoscope. Well, of course, I was coughing my head off from, from the metropolol that I was, it turns out I was allergic to. Well, my primary care told me one day, why don't you quit taking that? Just, I mean, for a day. Let's just see what happens. So I quit for one day. Next morning, I woke up. I was barely coughing just a little bit. Before, I was coughing so hard that I would retch, and I thought I was going to vomit. I'd almost aspirate. I was coughing so hard. And I'm telling you, it was horrible. It was the most horrible time. And lo and behold, I call my doctor, my, my primary care back, and I said, hey, this is what's going on. And she says, you need to get a hold of your cardiologist. And up here where I live, there's one whole cardiologist on this mountain. At least at that time there was. And an appointment was weeks away. At that point, I decided I'm going to take my health care into my own hands I quit taking metropolol, period. Suddenly I started feeling better. They put me on an antibiotic for the, for the pneumonia. 
the pneumonia started to go away. I'm going to tell you folks that you are in charge of your own health care. So I went down to Phoenix. I found a doctor down in Phoenix, and I went to him, a really good doctor. His, his name is uh, Dr. Breezeblatt, Warren Breezeblatt. He's over by Christown, by the old Baptist Hospital. Anyway, I'm going to get cut past all that. And he took me off of that, and they had my other cardiologist had recommended I take a Tenolol. So I was taking tropolol, a tenolol. What they are is they're beta blockers. The lols are all beta blockers. And when you get into the rills, like lisinopril, those are all ACE inhibitors. Well, it turns out in 2011, I got stung by bees. And I have developed allergies to things I just can't even believe. And I mean, they're serious allergies. And I can't take certain medicines or I may die. Well, I was taking a satinolol, and all of a sudden, under the sides of my arms, not under my arms, on my sides and on the backs of my arms, I started developing a rash, and it got really bad. Well, when I saw Dr. Breezeblatt, and I, he took me off of Plavix, thank God, finally, and I was also seeing my primary care, a lot of doctor stuff. Let me tell you, when you're on all these meds, every med you take will have some effect on something else in your body, even though it's helping what it needs to help. Well, anyway, I was having a problem with peeing real orange. See these scissors? I'm going to show you some scissors. They got orange handles. I mean, it was coming out almost not quite that orange. It looked like, like somebody had dumped apple juice in a in a white porcelain toilet when I was done peeing. It looked bad. And so I went to her. She did a, a liver workup. Now I'm seeing another doctor for liver and kidneys and all that, and Dr. Solomon, and she's down in the valley also. Well, anyway, going back to my other doctor, Dr. Breezeblatt, who is my cardiologist, I told him, I said, I think I'm allergic to that atenolol. He says, well, quit taking it. Gave me another one that, let me tell you, I research every med now that before I take it, I research it. I want to know what its effects are and all that. Well, it said that it was, they said refractory, Mayo Clinic says, it's refractory, or otherwise it is highly resistant to epinephrine. Well, I've got an EpiPen because after those bees stung me, Certain things can happen, like a bee sting, and I need to have an epi right then, or I may not make it. So, but I've never used it yet, but I have it. So anyway, lo and behold, I've got to have this epinephrine, and it says that epinephrine is resistant against the reaction you may have from this allergic reaction. I went to the pharmacist. He says, oh, man, you better not take that stuff. He says, you know, you're allergic to... To these beta blockers we thought we're learning now from experience so he says you might want to start taking something else and I said well doc all I'm on right now I mean not doc he's the pharmacist I said all I'm on right now is hydrochlorothiazide 12.5 and a baby aspirin once a day and I found that the baby that I'd wake up in the middle of the night and my heart would be pounding in me so hard that my wife could feel it in the bed right next to me I get up, take my blood pressure. Yes, I have high blood pressure then at that point. Not always, but just then. And it's 148 over 100 and, you know, pulse is 77. And you say, oh my gosh, what are you, stupid? Go to see the hospital again, you know? No, you know, you just take your, I took another 12.5 and that seemed to really help. Went back to bed, went back to sleep, woke up. Still a little bit high on blood pressure. Not that high, but not right yet. Did not take another dose of meds because that was 3 in the morning. So I just took my meds I would take at 6.30 at 3 instead. And it helped. So I started talking about that to the, to the pharmacist. He says, well, why don't you take a 12.5 in the morning when you get up, another one later in the afternoon. Because if you take it right before bed, you'll be up peeing all night, trust me. So you want to take it about 4 in the afternoon. And that seems to get me through the night pretty good. I still have high blood pressure when I get up, but not during the night. How do I know? I take my blood pressure a lot. A lot. I want to be sure. You know what? This pump in here is pretty fragile. It's pretty, it's pretty durable, but it's also very fragile after you've had heart surgery. 
and it gets really, really mad because somebody went in there, opened you up and handled it and did stuff to it and poked needles and sewed with thread into, a, you know, very fine thread, but nonetheless, it's mad. It's madder than heck. And so it's rebelling. <laughs> it's going to tell you, I don't like what you're doing to me. And, I'm, and it's mad for a long time. Anyway, long story short, let's get back from away from that for a minute. My doctors had me going to, to cardio, cardi, cardiac rehab. And so I'd go to cardiac rehab, and then the COVID came, and then I couldn't go to cardiac rehab. So I had to do my, take my own exercise in my own hands, which I don't have all the equipment they have, so I did what I could. Anyway, long story short, car cardiac rehab is your friend. If your doctor says, I want you to take car go to cardiac rehab, you need to go, trust me. If you don't go, you'll be sorry. Let's get away from all that. I want to tell you that I just graduated yesterday from cardiac rehab. They called me back, said, you can come. You only have three more treatments. And I went and I graduated. And they could not believe because when I very first started, I would go in there and I was constantly in what they what they called trigeminy and bigeminy, which means that I'm throwing a PVC every other heartbeat or, or and I do it two times in a row or three times or four times in a row sometimes. And as soon as I started exercising, it would just be there, be there. Be, and they were scared. They said, you can't keep exercising because you're going to go into B-fib or something. You know, they were afraid of it. Well, I told them I feel pretty good. I'm not lightheaded. I was a little bit. I, I budged a little bit because I wanted to get well. And I know exercise is the answer. And most my body kept saying, no, you don't want to exercise. But really, I had to exercise. Time's it. Okay, I got an appointment here pretty quick, so I have to hurry. Anyway, you don't want to exercise because your body is tired. It aches. It hurts. It's this. It's that. You got to tell your body. You got to be the commander of the ship. I'm telling you, you either take control or it'll take control. Because your body, your flesh says, I want this. It's kind of a spiritual lesson in this as well. Your body, your flesh says, I want this. It's not necessarily good for you. Anyway, they'll help you with diets. They'll help you with all that. I was 235 when I went in, when I had my heart attack. I hate calling it a heart attack because I didn't feel like, I didn't have the classic ton of weight on my chest, you know, like an elephant or, or a pile of bricks or something. I didn't have that. I didn't have it up my neck and down my arm. and I didn't have that. I had this pinch, and I was really tired, and I get winded really easy. You need, you really need to catch this quick, folks. If this is you, start seeing a cardiologist. I recommend it. Anyhow, six months after, now I can do 30 push-ups every morning. I do 30. I do about 25 squats. I don't want to get too carried away. I get on, I have a stationary bicycle. I get on there and go about 15 miles an hour and I don't put much resistance on it, just a very tiny little bit and I ride it for 25 minutes. I'm, <laughs> and I'm panting and it's, it's kind of hard, you know? And, and now I've, I've gone from five pound weights of curling to eight pound weights and I, you can't see it, but I'll, I'll lift them out like this out outward on both arms you see I got both arms out and I'll bring them to my back and I'll, I'll bring them behind me like this as I'm working out I'll bring them out straight and I'll hold them that that's real hard to do with eight pounds I almost can't do it but I will curl this way I curl this way I do come over my head now which I was not allowed to do let me tell you they're going to tell you don't lift don't do anything over your head because you could break this baby loose in here and you do not want to do that Trust me, you got to treat this wound with care. If you're the kind of person that has an anger issue and you want to get in a fight or something, all it takes is one punch right there. You're going to be in big trouble. So you need to learn to control your anger. You should have done that a long time ago. It might be why you're having the heart issue. <clears throat> I'm a pastor of a church sitting in my office right now, and I'm trying to talk to you and tell you that if you don't deal with your anger and with your things of unforgiveness, they will eat you up. And so I want to tell you today, you can live through this, but you have to make the choice. So for right now, I've got to sign out. 
I want to tell you, I'll come back. I'll talk to you again. I'm sorry I haven't been on for a long, long time, but I didn't come on for a specific reason, and that was I was recovering, and I wanted to know. Let me just tell you something. I am feeling so good right now, and all I take is two hydrochlorothiazide. That's a blood pressure pill. I take two of those, one in the morning, one in the evening, and I take two baby aspirins, one in the morning, one in the evening, and that's all. And I'm, and I'm going to go see the doctor on Monday, Dr. Breesblatt, and I have to see uh, Dr. Solomon here in just a couple of minutes, so I have to hurry. But anyway, I'm going to go see Dr. Solomon. I've got to, we have got to sit down and talk about my meds because I am not going to take a beta blocker. I will not take a beta blocker, and that's how I'm going to tell them. Uh, it's proven that I'm allergic to them. I'm also allergic to uh, statins, and I've had doctors give me statins to where I was covered from head to toe with rash. And it takes weeks for that to go away. So I want to tell you, be careful. Take control of your health. If you don't, somebody else will. And when somebody else will, it's going to be their best guess. And it's not necessarily going to be what's good for you. They're going to try to do what in normal circumstances would be the best for you. But you need to make sure you take care of your circumstances. I got to go for now, folks. It's really good. I hope to get back to you again real soon. We'll talk to you later. God bless you. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.